in Bubba Squad, kiddo. Daddy's got a story to tell. <sighs> Is it long? Sit down. For today's tale, we'll need to dial the clock back to the time when optimism died. The 20th century. It's a story of small disagreements festering beyond reason. A chronicle of quarrels lasting through all seasons. A fable of ideologic conflict growing tenser than treason. All of which culminated into what was called a war, despite no shots being fired. Dad, I already know about the Cold War. Yada yada, better dead than red, I know the drill. <laughs> what? That pathetic decades-long temper tantrum over whose money system was good and whose was the unholy abomination spawned from the bowels of the Ninth Circle of Hell? No, no, no. If I want to watch children cry about how numbered paper was handled while throwing around tubes, I go play Monopoly. I like my near-military conflicts like I like my woman. Full of crabs. I'm sorry, we're gonna talk about the Lobster War. It's the mid-1900s, and Europeans haven't quite grown out of their main character phase and need to make sure no one forgets. Oh, it's funny because the two movies are so different. Right. <laughs> I'm here too! Okay. Hey, drop it, drop the oil! But as the 1960s rolled around, tragedy struck. America had a jello mold phase. But other than that, nearly all of France's African colonies claimed they wanted independence, and as France loved being seen as the in vogue colonial power, they granted it to them to look hip and definitely not because they couldn't afford another colonial war. This was all fine and dandy, unless you were a French fisherman who just lost their free reign to catch lobster off the Mauritanian coast. Ah, uh -uh, slow your roll, Ratatouille, you need a permit for that now. Ah yes, there is plenty of lobster, don't be so shellfish. Leave the area and cut the puns or I'll detain you faster than a panzer tank. Ah, don't get all crabby. I'll be out of your hair in a pinch. <laughs> Stop! I'm claustrophobic! Ow. But luckily, a few of these fishermen heard some juicy gossip about this hot new spot just brimming with lobster on the other side of the Atlantic. And for the cherry on top, they were practically free for the taking, being surrounded by nothing but the open water, salty air, Brazil. The fishermen figured that last part could be a problem. You know, sovereign waters or something. So they sent out a delegation to negotiate a license. But waltzing up to a country and saying, Holy cannoli, that's a lot of lobster ravioli. How about instead of you guys fishing them to fuel your $20 million canning industry, I do the fishing and money getting part. Would most likely be met with, Ha ha, eat shit. Therefore, an elaborate ruse was needed to mask their fishing intentions. So they put together a pitch that was so intricate, so convincing, that the Brazilians would have no choice but to allow them coastal access to their lobster, all while being completely oblivious of their objective to harvest them. <clears throat> Thank you for meeting with us. We come to you with a pressing issue. You see, there have been seismic reports, sounds, if you will, of a disturbance in the deep, originating from your coast of Brazil. Jean, if you could just describe this disturbance for us. Of course. And you see, it was those clicks, thank you, John. It was those clicks that led us to lobster. Now for our next step. Okay, sorry. Uh, I think I know what this is. You boys are just here to conduct some routine research on lobster nurseries and just need one of those permits for a few boats, right? Uh, you know that is exactly what we wanted to do. <laughs> Yeah, we got the research license! The French fishermen acquired a license allowing three boats to conduct research on lobster nurseries, which should normally be a relatively non-invasive process. But they looked at this permit and thought, Haha, that's a funny way to spell four. And everyone knows research is only as good as your sample size, and the French like to be as accurate as possible. Sure, this is all technically in violation of their license, but I've been driving with a suspended one for three years now and haven't had any problems. Nevertheless, Western European nations have this refined analytical process to find out just how much they can bend the rules when it comes to a foreign country. So they ran the numbers on Brazil. Brazil, Brazil, Brazil. We're good! While the fishermen thought they'd pulled off a successful bamboozle, Brazilian authorities already thought something smelled fishy about these fishermen. And luckily for them, they also had a similar analytical process. France, France. Maybe we should check it out. Representatives were sent from the Brazilian Navy to act as inspectors and make sure the French fishermen were honoring the foundation of these nations' crustacean relations. They should be around here. Oh, that's them. 
Oh, welcome to the Red Lobster! We had an interest. A uh, table for two, yes? I've got the perfect romantic spot for you two Romeos. What? No, we aren't. Doesn't matter. We're here representing the Brazilian Navy. Oh, shit, Brazil? Yes, 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 yes. Welcome to the Red Lobster! Uh, a research center, yes, yes, yes. Let me just get our uh, head aside. Pierre! Pierre has been making some incredible progress. Oh, yeah? What have you found out in your uh, research? They hurt. Oh, what, you get pinched, Lil? No. You'll never amount to anything. <laughs> Upon investigation, they found that, along with violating the boat limit, the ships were not conducting research, but in fact, carrying out large-scale predatory lobster fishing with a trawl. Trawling is this neat practice where you put a net in the water and catch the everything. Environmental impact? <laughs> what environment? So Brazil was like... Stop and revoke the fisherman's license, sending them lobster tail between the anchors back on over to the land of macaroons in April of 1961. And with that, things return to normal. Uh, excuse me, there have been seismic reports, sounds, if you will. The fisherman returned in November to request another research license, but this time further out at sea on the continental shelf, outside of Brazil's territorial waters, which stretch 760,320 gumballs from the shore or for Simpleton's 12 miles. This request was granted, and for the rest of the year, Brazil kept a close eye on them while the fishermen played the nautical version of I'm not touching you. But just like an early 2000s cartoon fish, the French just couldn't keep their grubby little paws off those luscious lobsters. And on January 2nd, 1962, the French boat Cassiope was found catching lobster about 10 miles off the shore. Ten, 10 miles! Got you! Ha <laughs> ha! You're within our waters now, cheese boy! Uh, you sure? Uh... Hold this! One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. A Brazilian corvette seized the French vessel for catching lobster without authorization, probably hitting a sick drift as it pulled up, but then again, everything I know about Brazil comes from Fast Five. Anyway, by now shit's getting pretty serious and mom and dad need to get involved. So whilst the fishermen and navy battled the lobster sea, the French and Brazilian governments battled the diplomacy. <laughs> the war of the pen commenced, and at the heart of this battle in the fierce political trenches was one vital question. Like... What is a lobster? Sounds like a silly question, right? What is a lobster? Why, it's the underwater excavator, the crustacean of the basin, the pogo stick with a prick. But even my definition of a lobster as nature's gripper snippers wouldn't have been sufficient for the contending nations. They wanted to know whether or not a lobster was a fish. France made the claim that a lobster was in fact a fish, so therefore, they had the right to catch them according to the basis for fishing on the high sea set by the Geneva Convention of 1958. Brazil, for their part, pushed the thesis that lobsters were not a fish, but in fact, an economic resource, a part of their continental shelf, that they had the sovereign right to exploit, according to a different provision of the same Geneva Convention. They said, citing a treaty they didn't sign. And this wasn't like your average 12 hour Twitter beef. This diplomatic battle lasted all through 1962 and part of 63, which is hilarious considering the other things going on in the world stage during that time. Kennedy is having us increase our troop presence in Vietnam. 400 Green Berets were a start, but they aren't gonna be enough. Agreed. We must be careful though. We don't want to replace the French as a colonial force in the area and bleed as the French did. That's a good point. Got any advice, France? So now with the pangolin being a G. Geode, yes, according to our established law of modus operandi derived from the Fly Eater Sarlacc Pit model, yes, yes, then when taking the Laplace transform of this in a matrix with the crustacean equation, we find that lobster are in fact fish. No, 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 this completely violates the Capricorn theorem. <sighs> Let's back this up. While that reality sadly only exists in my head canon, France and Brazil did do their best to support their claims and own each other with facts and logic. Brazil's evidence was that lobsters were like oysters and that they both cling to the ocean floor, making them a part of the continental shelf. But France argued that when a lobster hops around the ocean floor, it's essentially swimming, making it a fish, which prompted Brazil's navy expert in oceanography, him to spit some iconic bars. If a lobster is a fish because it moves by jumping, then a kangaroo is a bird. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a pretty solid point. Yeah, and if a kangaroo is a bird, then, then a flying fish is a spaceship because it jumps through the air. Uh, 
a little weaker, but okay. And, and if a flying fish is a spaceship, then a seagull is an oil rig because it dives underwater. Uh, okay, let, let's settle down. No, if a seagull is an oil rig, then my wife is a fucking whore because she's just from man to man. Okay, so I made up the end there, but don't worry. The first part is a real quote that you can safely add to your Instagram bio. While mom and dad fight in their room, let's check out how things are going on in the water and wow, France just doesn't care. Like the IRS at my front door, the fishermen just kept coming back, completely unfazed by the international turmoil and monolithic tubes of death pointed at their face. So the Brazilian Navy just continued seizing their ships, going, stop it, while making them sign a paper swearing they wouldn't return. But the French were like, ha I can't read this, and would often just come back anyway. In one instance, a French ship was caught by a patrol off the northeastern coast to order them to sail to deeper waters. At first, the fisherman captain ignored them, but while he may not have spoken Portuguese, there are only a few ways you can interpret a blaring alarm stating Postos de Combati. Postos de Combati. Postpone, Postpone the confetti? Ah, uh, but you promised! Postpone. Sources differ on the exact timing, but it was around now when the French fishermen were getting pretty fed up with being told what to do, so they started to complain. And by complain, I mean they personally petitioned warships for protection from French President Charles de Gaulle himself. De Gaulle said lobter, and granted the request, sending gunboats along with five more fishing vessels to the Brazilian coast. The French sailed over with a lot more confidence this time. I mean, they've got defenses now. When has that ever failed France? But unfortunately for them, Brazil was about as likely to let them swipe their salty sea spiders as Hollywood is to pay their riders. So the Brazilian Navy boarded these fishing boats without a second thought. Whoa shit, I didn't think they'd seize them with us right here. Well, should we do something? No, oh, you crazy? Haven't you seen Fast Five? Much like a pilot to a millionaire's island, the French Navy sat there and did nothing. But the same couldn't be said on the diplomatic front, as it was then that the French ambassador to Brazil visited President Joao Goulart about the issue. Goulart stated he didn't want any trouble with France, and made the surprise presidential order to release three captured fishing boats and allow them to fish. Honey, they reopened that red lobster. Terry, we are a loyal Long John Silvers family. As expected, the Brazilian people were none too pleased about this, and the resulting backlash pushed the government to rescind this permission shortly thereafter. Things then escalated even further when in late February 1963, Brazil delivered an ultimatum. All Frenchies have 48 hours to skedaddle skedoodle to the land of poodles, else they'd get the noodle. I may or may not have written that line while intoxicated, but I wouldn't dare delete a line full of such eccentric flavor. However, over in France, this lobster war was really starting to get on de Gaulle's nerves. Ugh, first they can't fish, then they can. Just kidding, they can't. Oops, now they've got two days to leave town. God, I don't understand this emotion I'm feeling. What you are experiencing is known as mixed signals, sir. No, I'm sure I tuned this radio to AM. No, I mean like, you know when a girl is kind of hinting she likes you, but you can't quite tell if she's into you because her actions give conflicting signs? Those are mixed signals. Paul, I'm rich in the president of France. I don't get mixed signals, I get bitches. So don't speak to me about your poor people problems. Now on one hand, Brazil is an important strategic partner of the French. The latter has invested over a thousand million francs into the former, and they rely on the iron smelting, textiles, and chemical products of Brazil. Psst, 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 psst. Also, Brazil is capitalist and can help fight nearby growth of communism. So, some would say, it would be in the best interest of France to be like, wow, you know, maybe we shouldn't go to war over the ocean bugs that piss out their face. But on the other hand, this wasn't the people's France, this was de Gaulle's France. And seeing as how this was the man who tried escaping World War I prison camps five times, once while posing as a nurse, it should be no surprise to hear that de Gaulle was a very stubborn man. And this stubborn man considered Brazil's actions to be a slight on the majesty of France, so he did not back down. But instead, dispatched the French destroyer Tartu to the Brazilian coast. Tempers are flaring, ministers are swearing. With this newest escalation, Brazil is preparing. The newspapers have been rousing the public, and the atmosphere in Brazil is one of imminent war. The Tartu by itself wasn't a huge concern. What made things scarier was where it came from. A whole task force of French ships merely three days away, containing not only a state-of-the-art aircraft carrier, but also a tanker named Le Bays which means the fuck in French, which is also a river in France, which also flows through the town of Condom. Mobilize the Navy. Understood, sir. Wait. And the Air Force. 
But there's one small problem with this mobilization. It's the eve of Brazil's favorite holiday, the Carnival. A time for wild celebration, dancing to music, stealing comically large vaults with Dodge Chargers. Oh wait, that's Fast Five again. And this year, people were really memeing this whole situation. Even some masked revelers went around with lobster costumes. So much of Brazil's personnel were on short leave. But with some effort, they mobilized enough men, granted them war pay, and launched ships to search for the Tartu under Operation Lobster. Along with these ships, Brazil continued to mobilize to meet the French at sea. Because sure, their arsenal was full of vintage World War II vessels, and sure, they only had enough ammunition for 30 minutes of combat, and sure, they lacked adequate fuel supplies, and sure, some ships were decommissioned with mechanical problems, and sure, the French had a state-of-the-art navy and air force to counter them, but at least they had their spirit and family. Brazil's planes that had been searching for the Tartu finally spot it, causing it to start shooting exercises, probably to deter the aircraft. The plane responded by flying even lower to show they aren't messing around. Oh wow, that's cute! Neat little guns you got there! Uh oh, what's this? These looks like rockets. Wow, these sure are big, huh? Brazil's ships made their way towards the Tartu's location late at night. Dawn approached, and the sea was veiled with a fog. In the distance, their radar detects something in the water. Making their way closer, tensions running high, they finally made out the Tartu in the mist and- Oh, it's gone. Running low on fuel, the Tartu retreated and was replaced with a much weaker ship. Oh hey, what about us? <laughs> You'll be fine, another ship is coming! <laughs> hey guys, what's up? Oh! With the playing field set and more Brazilians on the way, it was now just a matter of who would shoot first. Hey, maybe we should go back and fish where we belong. Africa. The French ships decided to head back across the Atlantic. After this, an agreement was signed where Brazil would allow limited French ships to fish for five years while sharing profits with Brazil, who would also get to expand the nautical miles of its territory. You know, just a few. Hundred. While in the end, France decided war wasn't worth it, to be honest, I'm surprised it got even remotely this far. Running some numbers, if one anti-aircraft gun on one French vessel fired for just 11 minutes, say in case it wanted to teach some smartass aircraft a lesson, you'd already rack up an ammunition bill more expensive than the $3 million a year the French fishermen were raking in. But to be honest, with the cost and street cred for a European nation losing a diplomatic war with Brazil over lobster? Perhaps World War III would have just been worth it. The Lobster War. 8 out of 10 stars.